Well, hey, everybody, welcome back to class and welcome to module number four, the anxiety disorders. It is hard to believe that we are already at module four. We only have eight modules in this class. And so with the completion of, of this module, we're actually going to be about halfway through this course. And that's hard to believe, but we're moving right along right where we are supposed to be. I hope that you're doing well. Hope things are going okay for you. Hope that you're navigating again the classroom well. And I know that you uh, hopefully are learning a lot of good new stuff or you're having some information reinforced, some stuff that you already knew in this class. So we are talking in this section about the anxiety disorders. Now, this is module number four. Next module, module number five, is where we talk about the obsessive compulsive related and the trauma and stress trauma and stressor related disorders in module number five. These two modules kind of go together because in a way, the common denominator through all of them is anxiety. And anxiety is something that every single one of us is familiar with. Just like we talked about with module number three, when we talked about the mood disorders, um, all of us know what it's like to feel down, depressed, sad, or blue from time to time. We all know what our mood is. And one of those moods or emotions is anxiety. And all of us know what it is like to feel stressed or worried or afraid or tense or panicked or whatever it may be. Anxiety is a normal human expected emotion. We live in a world today where it's natural for us to feel anxious at times and to feel afraid at times and to feel worried at times. It's something that just comes along with the human experience. All of us know what that is like. And so in and of itself, anxiety is not an unhealthy, negative, inappropriate, negative emotion. It is, just, it is what it is. It is an emotion. But just like with mood disorders, we know, though, that there are times when you and I or people in the world can really struggle with anxiety, where they can struggle with worry or fear or panic or dread or stress or whatever it may be, and struggle with them in the way that it, it, that it kind of meets the definition of those three Ds we talked about back in Module number one, their, their anxiety, their worry, their stress rises to the level that it is it becomes disruptive to their normal daily functioning and or it is distressing to them. It, it, it begins to be something that they become worried about or begins to become distressing to other people and or it becomes a detour in their lives, which just means that it is anxiety or worry or fear that is just outside the realm of what we would consider typical or expected or common in most situations, given what we know about the person and the situation. So anxiety disorders, that's what the word disorder means. The word disorder just means someone's anxiety has risen to the level that it is disruptive, that, is, that is, it is distressing, and that it is a detour in the person's life. And anxiety disorders, like mood disorders, are very commonly experienced and very commonly diagnosed. That's that's I think that's part of why the DSM-5 puts them together in these back-to-back -back chapters. Mood disorders are very commonly experienced and therefore commonly diagnosed. And now the anxiety disorders, they are commonly experienced as well, too. So we're going to be looking at, in this section, uh, the, the anxiety disorder chapter, there are several different um, disorders in this family. But there are five that really are very are much more common than the others that I want you to be familiar with. I want you to be familiar with the names. I want you to be familiar with the core symptoms and a little bit of background on, on each of those five. And my hunch is probably on most of these five, you already are probably familiar a little bit with a little bit of each and every single one of them. And so we're going to be talking about in this section, in this module, specific phobias, social anxiety disorder, panic disorder, agoraphobia, and generalized anxiety disorder. My hunch is you probably have heard of at least a couple of those before, and it may, you might already know a little bit about what are some of the common symptoms of those kinds of disorders. And what's kind of what, what our goal for this kind of section is, is to kind of go through and look at just the key features of each of those um, disorders. What I want to do, though, too, in this little intro video is I want to review for you, kind of like I do in all these videos, just kind of some high points of the lecture notes. And I want to make sure again that I stress to you that in addition to watching the little mini videos I posted for you, go in and look at the set of lecture notes that I provided for you. You can print those out, put them in a notebook if you want to. Look at all the little vi other videos that I put up for you. If I put up any little case studies, look at those as well too as you get ready to do your homework and then get ready for uh, the quiz for this module. And what I one of the things I highlight, I want to highlight in this video that I highlight in your lecture notes are just some key facts 
kind of like we did back with the mood disorders and with bipolar disorder, I want to kind of just highlight for you just again, some, some really important kind of foundational ideas related to anxiety. I've already done a couple of those. Um, I think there's six of them in the lecture notes. The first one I've already reviewed for you, and that's just this. Because anxiety is a normal, typical human emotion, it's really important for us to understand that anxiety disorders are those times when people struggle with anxiety and worry and fear outside the realm of typical in, in kind of kind of more in severe kind of ways. So just because you know someone or you are someone who occasionally stresses or worries or is kind of anxious or has anxiety or whatever, does that mean that you have an anxiety disorder? No. But what it means is that there are people though in our world that do have anxiety and struggle with anxiety and fear and worry to that level to where it kind of is at the level of an anxiety disorder. So the three D's are really, really important. Number two, remember we talked about the word comorbid, comorbid or comorbidity before. Comorbidity means co, a co-occurring or occurs alongside, or like I like to say, the kind of things oftentimes kind of run together. So back in the mood disorder section, one of the things I highlighted for you, one of the key facts is that people who have to battle depression and bipolar disorder often battle anxiety symptoms as well. They run together. Mood problems and anxiety problems are two separate things, but oftentimes they run together. So in this section on anxiety disorders, let me highlight this. Many, I, I don't mention it in here, but many of the anxiety disorders we're going to talk about in this section, it would not be uncommon for a person to also battle depression. We see that a lot with anxiety and, by, and vice versa. A lot of people who battle depression also battle anxiety. Well, for this module, a lot of people who battle anxiety also have the symptoms of major depressive disorder or persistent depressive disorder or bipolar one or bipolar two. Uh, anxiety disorders and mood disorders often run alongside each other. They're often comorbid with each other. That's important to keep in mind. Often too, be aware of this. We believe that most anxiety disorders are actually uh, the result of chemical imbalances. They're brain based. Now we think about anxiety disorders in relation to the world around us. It's, it's very natural for us to think, well, yeah, the reason why someone struggles with lots of anxiety is because they got lots of bad things happening around them, lots of stress happening around them. You know, there's lots of stress in our world and lots of things happen in our world we don't have control over. And people are worried about their finances and their jobs and their kids and what's kind of going on in our world. Yeah, that's why people struggle with anxiety. Well, some of that is true. But we believe that most anxiety disorders are actually not environmentally based. They're chemical based. They're inside of us, not outside of us. And so we believe, just like with most mental health conditions, that the anxiety disorders are brain-based conditions caused by chemical imbalances in the part of the brain that manage that part of our emotional state of anxiety, of calm, of, of threat, fight or flight, those kinds of things. So even though environmental factors often are at play when it comes to anxiety, we believe most of them are brain-based, neurologically-based, chemical imbalance hereditary genetic kinds of things. So that's an key, that's a key idea. So just like I highlighted for you with major depressive disorder, we always think about major depressive disorder being a disorder that people battle because of stuff happening to them or around them. Some of that is true. But many, many people battle depression and things around them are okay, we would say. And, and their depression is more of an internal kind of a chemical imbalance struggle. The same thing would be true for most of these anxiety disorders. Now there's an exception to that and it's what we'll talk about next module. It's the disorder you're already familiar with called post-traumatic stress disorder. That's a little bit of an outlier. We'll talk more about that next module. But for all five of these, specific phobia, agoraphobia, social anxiety disorder, panic disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, we believe that most of those are more hereditary, genetic, brain-based in as far as in their causation. That's important. It's also to highlight that, again, although people can begin battling the symptoms of an anxiety disorder at any time in their lives, um, most often, in most instances, people report that they began to uh, experience the symptoms of their anxiety disorder in late adolescence, early adulthood. So here we go again. Here's This is like the third module in a row where I've highlighted that. We see this pattern in mental health conditions where most of the time, people realize something is not right. Something is not going well in my life. Usually between the ages of, we would say 15 and 25. Usually it's in that age range where people begin to, to realize that something is not right. So most phobias, most generalized anxiety, most panic attacks, most social anxiety, most battles with agoraphobia, we normally see by the age of 25, most often. Now, does that mean if I get to the age of 26, 27, or 30, 
that I'll never develop a phobia or never start having panic attacks. That's not true. But generally, we would say it is true that generally most mental health conditions begin to show themselves in people's lives, most often between the ages of 15 or 18 and 25 or 28. Late adolescence, early adulthood. So that is true for anxiety disorders. Another key fact, again, as is, as is the case with all the mental health conditions that we're going to talk about in this class, there is a wide range of variability with how the symptoms show themselves. And that, and that in some situations, you know, people's symptoms are chronic and kind of kind of always there in other situations. A person might battle anxiety, but they may have periods where they're doing really, really well. And then they have like spells or bouts of anxiety or panic. And so in some cases, symptoms come and go. In some cases, symptoms are consistent and chronic and persistent. Um, one person, you know, one person with, say, generalized anxiety disorder may look a little bit different than another person with the same disorder. So we have these symptom checklists, but not every single person fits neatly into those checklists. And so there's a lot, there's a wide range of variability when it comes to how these disorders can and do look in people's lives. And then lastly is this idea, uh, anxiety disorders like the mood disorders are often complicated by substance abuse and addiction, not always, but often. So we do see that people sometimes will begin to abuse substances as a way to self-medicate their symptoms. So people with anxiety, for example, often have a hard time sleeping. That's just one example. And, um, and they may then begin to rely on sub substances, legal or illegal, whether it's alcohol or it's pills or it's marijuana or something else, maybe as a way to relax and to be able to go to sleep at night to kind of deal with their anxiety. A lot of people with social anxiety disorder abuse marijuana, for example, or alcohol, because those two substances are kind of numbers. They might say numbers, I mean, you know, that they, they kind of they kind of calm people down, help people feel a little bit more focused, help people to feel a little bit more safe and secure. The example I use is like a warm blanket. So, so you know, certain certain substances are like putting a warm blanket on. Like we'll be there. So a lot of the depressants like alcohol and some of the painkillers, some of the sleep medicines, marijuana is another example. It's like putting on a warm blanket. It's kind of it's got that soothing kind of numbing effect. And so if I'm in pain, like with depression, or if I'm really stressed, like with anxiety disorders, those types of sub substances are real tempting because people may find that, hey, if I, like, for example, I've had clients before who have social anxiety disorder and they said, hey, the only way I can go to work is get high. Or the only way I can go to school is I can, is, is to use a substance and use some kind of substance legal or illegal in the morning, help me kind of calm down and kind of, kind of calm my anxiety down. So we see that co-occurring, that comorbidity sometimes between mental health conditions, like in this case, anxiety related disorders. and um, mental health conditions. And so, so we oftentimes see substances and mental health conditions kind of running together oftentimes. So just some key factors as we think about this idea of anxiety related disorders. So there's five we're going to talk about in this section. I want to go ahead and cover the first one. The first one is very, very interesting. And as I note in the, in the, in the lecture notes, it is one of the oldest identifiable mental health conditions in documented history. And it is a phobia. And I want to just ask you this. You know that a phobia is a fear. And I want to just ask you this as we talk about phobias. What is it that you're afraid of? Do you have something? Most of us have. Most people have something, in my experience. Most people have something that they really are kind of fearful of and they're frightened of and they're afraid of. Some people are afraid of the dark. Some people are afraid of snakes or bugs or cockroaches. Maybe you're afraid of tight, confined spaces like elevators. Uh, maybe you're afraid of heights. Maybe you're afraid of loud noises like thunder or natural disaster, natural like events like tornadoes or hurricanes. Um, maybe you have a fear that we might say is a little unusual. Maybe you have a fear of like clowns or like a student in a class a couple of semesters ago, she had a fear of water. She could not go near any large body of water. She had to start freaking out. She said, I'm okay, like with a swimming pool in someone's backyard. But she said, I've got this weird thing when I go near like a lake. Or the ocean, this 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 thing, this this fear starts coming up inside of me, and there's something about the, a large body of water that absolutely terrifies me. So those are all just examples of fears. And so the term phobia literally means um, to be afraid of or to run from. It's an old Greek Latin term. And so phobias have been identified and documented in literature for years and years and years. Phobias are very, very interesting. They have been studied from Sigmund Freud all the way to modern day people. Freud, for example, was very fascinated by people's fears. 
And really what fascinated him was why are people afraid? Why are we always afraid? Why are we often afraid of things that we can't control? Why are we afraid? Why is one person afraid of dogs, but another person is afraid of snakes? And the person who's afraid of snakes loves dogs. And the person who's afraid of dogs loves snakes. So why is it dogs in one instance and snakes in another? Why, why is one person afraid of heights, but yet, you know, they're not afraid of public speaking, but one person can be afraid of public speaking, but then they'll go jump out of an airplane. They love roller coasters. So just, 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 just the fascination of the things that fear us. Well, really the DSM-5 is not as much interested in the cause of our phobias. It's just interested in, in this class, we're just going to talk a little bit about what is a phobia. So a phobia is a, a marked and persistent fear of a specific person, object, place, or situation. It is a marked and persistent fear of a specific object, place, person, or situation. And the DSM-5 uses this two-word phrase. I want you to grab onto this two-word phrase. And it is the phrase specific phobia. That is, that is the phrase for this class. The phrase specific phobia is this broad, it is a huge, broad term. And underneath this term go all of the hundreds of thousands of specific places, persons, objects, situations that people can be afraid of. And so under the term specific phobia are all of these different fears. So I'm going to give you, let's talk a little bit more about those fears and about, about, about a little bit more qualifier. So a, a, a marked and persistent fear of a specific person, place, object, or situation. And then there are these qualifiers. Because a lot of us would say, well, gosh, I have a phobia because I don't like public speaking. Well, maybe you do. Let me ask you these questions. If someone's fear, someone's fear is a phobia. We'll say it that way. Someone's fear is a phobia if also in addition to that definition, Anytime I am exposed to whatever I'm afraid of, whether it is literally or even in my mind or in my ear, let me tell you what that means. So if I was really terrified of water, just thinking about in my mind water or hearing someone talk about water in my ear or actually going to water. So the idea of exposure, exposure doesn't have to be literal exposure, but anytime I am exposed literally in my ear or in my mind, if when that happens, there is almost always immediate fear and anxiety within me. So if I'm afraid of water, anytime I think about going to the lake, or if I'm afraid of flying on an airplane, anytime I think about getting on an airplane, or I hear someone else talking about getting on an airplane, or I go see, I have to go to the airport to get my son or my daughter. Well, we know someone's fear is a phobia if it produces immediate um, fear or anxiety anytime I'm exposed to it. And the it is whatever it is I'm afraid of. That's the first thing. Second thing is we know someone's fear is a phobia if they engage in active avoidance of the situation, of, of, of whatever they're fearful of, or if they can't avoid it, they endure it stressful. So it's active avoidance or, active avoidance or stressful endurance is what we listen for in counseling. So if someone is afraid of water, we would say, well, so do you have situations then where you avoid going near the water? I mean, it's kind of a natural question, kind of common sense. Well, yeah. I, so, I, so I don't go to the lake when my family goes to the lake. So I don't go. I don't drive over that bridge. I go around. So that's active avoidance. Stressful endurance means that if I can't avoid it, well, then I, so then I, while I'm facing it, I'm stressing out. So a person who would be like fear, afraid of public speaking has to take a, um, a speech class, maybe as a part of their college degree plan. And they don't have any option. They have to, they have to give a speech. They can't go to the professor and say, well, I have a phobia of speaking in public. Well, the professor is going to make you do it anyway. So if, so if I cannot actively avoid, avoid it, I may give the speech. But while I'm giving the speech, it is a what we call stressful endurance. It is, a, it is hard for me to do it, and I am stressed out while I am doing it, and I have all this anxiety and panic before I do it, and I almost can't do it while I'm doing it, and then as soon as it's over, there's all this, I have to kind of come down off this, almost like a traumatic event. I'm so afraid of water that, you know, I mean, I avoid the lake when I can, but if my husband is driving or my wife is driving and they drive over that bridge, I don't make them stop, but man, I close my eyes and grip my teeth for the few seconds and it's like, like I'm out of breath afterwards. So active avoids or stressful endurance. So immediate fear or anxiety whenever I'm exposed to the situation 
active avoidance slash stressful endurance. Third thing would be, we know someone's fear is a phobia if their fear is just, we would say it's out of proportion. We used to use the word inappropriate. We don't use that word anymore. It is out of, purport, it is out of proportion to the situation. So here's what I mean by that. So the bottom line is just, it's just excessive. So my fear of water, for example, if, if, if I was the one who was afraid of water, like my former student, um, is my fear of water excessive? So is it just outside the realm of typical, what would we, we would consider typical for fear of water? Well, in most cases, the answer to that is yes. Um, the idea, for example, the idea of being afraid of water when I don't even go near the water. Well, how can water harm me if I don't go near it, right? But but if I were if I were really afraid of water, just walking up to the water, not even getting in the water, I'm terrified of it. Well, being terrified of something that really can't hurt me is not very is not really very healthy or appropriate, right? So that so we, we would consider it out of proportion or inappropriate. So is someone's fear to that level to where it's just excessive or out of proportion? Is it persistent and chronic? Is another key idea with a phobia. If you ever hear someone say, "Well, I kind of have a phobia of spiders sometimes." but not all the time. Well, that's not a phobia. A phobia is where someone has a fear of spiders all the time, persistent and chronic. If someone says, well, I kind of, you know, well, I'm not sure if I'm afraid of water or not. I mean, I'll go get in the lake sometimes, but then there are sometimes, well, I'm not, that's not really a phobia because a phobia is the fear is marked and persistent. Marked just means it is, it is identifiable. Um, if someone says, I, I, I have a phobia, but I'm not sure what it's uh, of what, I'm afraid of lots of things. Well, like what? Well, I, I'm not sure specifically what I'm afraid of. Well, that's not a phobia, right? Because a phobia is there is a specific object, person, place, or situation that fear is persistent and it is chronic. It is consistent in someone's life. And then the last thing, the last qualifier is the fear is strong enough that it is out of proportion, excuse me, that it causes some level of disruption in daily functioning. And again, you have to kind of use your common sense there, right? So a, a, a specific phobia, keyword, a specific phobia is a marked and persistent fear of a specific person, place, object, or situation. That fear, um, the fear produces immediate anxiety or, or fear of anytime I'm exposed to the thing I'm afraid of. There's active avoidance or stressful endurance. Uh, the fear is out of, out of proportion. It's, it's inappropriate or excessive. It's out of proportion. It is persistent and chronic, and at some level, it causes disruption or dysfunction. Now, here's another key thing with phobias. I want to highlight this for you as well, too, as we kind of move forward. One of the things we're going to talk about in the next module, in module number five, is a disorder that all of us are familiar with called post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. Here's the tricky thing with phobias. Technically, a specific phobia is a fear that we're not sure why the person is afraid of it. Okay, so that, that's important. So if I have a fear of water, and, and it, let's say I was your client, and I had a fear of water, one of the questions you're going to want to ask me is, Glenn, have you ever had a negative, stressful, or traumatic event around water in your life? That's a very, very, what we call a differential diagnosis question. Because if I say, well, yeah, I, I almost drowned when I was a little child. Well, it could be that my fear of water is really not a specific phobia. It could be a symptom of what we call a post-traumatic situation. It could be more PTSD. So a specific phobia is a term we use for most phobias where we're not sure why the person is afraid of fill in the blank. Glenn, are you are you afraid of water? Have you ever had a negative or traumatic experience with water? Many people would say, no, I don't know why I'm afraid of the water. It's weird because I'm not afraid of taking a shower or getting a bath. I'll go in my backyard and get in the pool. But man, I will not go. When I go to Galveston, I freaks me out. I don't go on the beach. I don't get in the water. I don't go on the ocean. My husband and I were going to take a cruise last year, you know, and I didn't I didn't want to go on a cruise because I was afraid of the water. You know, you may ask me if I was your client, your client, Glenn, have you ever had a negative, stressful, traumatic event with water? If the answer is no, I don't know why I'm afraid of, or whatever, heights, driving on the freeway, bugs, spiders, that's a specific phobia. If I were to say to you, well, yeah, I know why I'm afraid of water, or I know why I'm afraid of dogs, or I know why I'm afraid of public speaking, or I know why I'm afraid of flying, 
is because when I was eight years old, I was on an airplane, almost crashed. And ever since then, I don't get on airplanes. Well, that's more what we call a post-traumatic reaction. And, and so that may be more fitting with PTSD. We'll talk more about that next module. So that's a key idea. It's very, very common for us to, after we've had traumatic, stressful, traumatic events or with situations or objects or people, we avoid them and we're afraid of them. That is just the way, that, that, that's just the normal fight or flight way our brain kind of works, right? And so, and so phobias are very common after, are, are commonly developed after a traumatic event. And so specific phobias though, a key idea with a specific phobia is in most instances, we don't know why the person is afraid of it, uh, of it, whatever it is, okay? So that's a key idea. We're gonna come back and talk about phobias and fears a little bit next module when we talk about, um, about trauma. I also list for you in your lecture notes, uh, someone, if someone were to ask me, Professor Killian, how many different phobias are out there in the world today? Well, let me ask you, I'll answer it with this, I'll answer it with a question. Well, a phobia is a, a marked and persistent fear of a specific person, object, place, or situation. How many specific objects, places, situations, or people are in the world? Well, there's thousands. So guess what? That means that there are potentially thousands of different types of phobias out there. People can be afraid and develop a phobia around anything. I have seen through the years hundreds of different things that people can be, we would say, become phobic of or around. Now, we know there are some common ones. I've already mentioned several of these to you already. Heights and bugs and spiders and snakes and public speaking and those kinds of things. But really, people can develop a phobia around anything. And again, the key idea here, too, is the DSM-5 uses this two-word term, specific phobia, to, to categorize all of those fears. The term specific phobia, a very broad, broad term. So if someone has a fear of dogs, how does the DSM define, define or diagnose them? As having a specific phobia. What about me and my fear of water? The DSM-5 would diagnose me as having a specific phobia, as long as my fear met all those qualifications. What about someone who has a fear of public speaking? Specific phobia, right? So all the hundreds or thousands of different fears that people can have, the DSM-5 makes it easy on us. It just gives us this broad two-word term, specific phobia, as a way to categorize and identify all of those fears. So that is the very first specific phobia of the five different mental health conditions that we want to cover in this module that belong to this family. So go through, look at your lecture notes, come back and look at the next couple of videos and as we cover the next four, and I'll see you next time.